2022. And uh, first up, we have Senate File 2704 brought to us by Senator Bach. Welcome to Health and Human Services. You got to stop over a little more often. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sure I've been on this committee somewhere during my time here, but it, I tell you what, it hasn't been very many times. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I hope, I hope um, my I hope my my memory of it is fond, so that I want to come back someday. That's what we'll, we will treat you really nice today. So <laughs> you can uh, go ahead and introduce your bill, um, well, and uh, then we'll get to your testifiers and uh, talk about what you've got before us. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, thank you for having us today. This is one of those bills, you know, as a member of the legislature, every once in a while you stumble onto something that's purely constituent driven. And uh, last October, I was up on the North Shore. I generally go up there uh, every fall after the leaves fall off when things slow down a little bit and, and meet with people along the shore to kind of see how things are going. And one of the stops that I made this October was at the North Shore Care Center, the hospital up in Grand Marais. Uh, they have an uh, attached nursing home. So I really, uh, the administrator, Kimber Wall, said that's here, said, you know, I just want to take you on a tour through here. They had just finished a big construction project there. I'd been there a year before when they were still working on it. She said, I'd, I'd like you to see what our employees are going through with COVID, you know, because we all heard about the stress on, on healthcare workers. And it really was really good to see firsthand what they're going through. And, and then uh, Kimber suggested to me a way where I could help the hospital nursing home. And I think all of us on this committee know that uh, especially rural uh, nursing homes are really struggling to stay afloat. We've lost a number of them over the last decade. So uh, Kimber had come up with an idea to allow these critical access hospitals with an attached nursing home uh, to be able to uh, not increase the number of beds in the facility, but just through uh, kind of an accounting measure, uh, bring in some additional federal money to help uh, the hospital nursing home so she can explain it much better than i can so uh, mr chairman i appreciate the committee's uh, uh attention to this and with that i'll have my testifier well thank you and welcome to our committee uh miss walstead and uh, if you would please just identify yourself for the record and then please go ahead with your testimony thank you good afternoon Charetke and committee members I'm Kimber Ralstead, and I'm the Administrator of North Shore Health in Grand Marais, and I'm here to express my support for Senate File 2704. So, as Senator Bach said, North Shore Health, we're a small, rural, remote healthcare organization. We're comprised of a 16-bed critical access hospital, a 37-bed skilled nursing facility, a home health agency, and ambulance service. We're all located in Grand Marais. The next closest nursing home is 60 miles away in Silver Bay. And the next closest hospital is 80 miles away in Two Harbors. We're also a hospital district with tax levy authority. And our tax levy has increased over the years with our most recent levy being $1.3 million. But I'd like to give a little context for this legislation. For the last 15 years, the nursing home that is a part of North Shore Health has lost an average of $1.5 million a year. Even with tax levy, the ability of North Shore Health to maintain that level of loss is not sustainable. Now, as you're aware, nursing home reimbursement, it is not as simple as just increasing our charges to cover our expenses. And as a hospital attached nursing home, we are also subject to Medicare hospital cost report rules, and we have to allocate expenses based upon those guidelines. This usually results in us moving expenses from the hospital that is reimbursed at 101% of allowed costs to the nursing home where our costs exceed the limits established by the Department of Human Services. So for example, in 2020, our nursing home, other operating costs exceeded the operating per diem limit by $42.65 per resident day or $530,000 for the year. These reimbursement rules have us moving expenses from one area where we could get paid 101% of allowed costs to an area where we're over the limits, so we don't get paid at all. At various times over the years, due to the financial losses, it's been suggested that the nursing home be closed. This is difficult to contemplate because we are the only skilled nursing facility in Cook County. 
Our citizens needing this level of care would need to leave their home community and their family members and friends would have to travel possibly two hours or more to see them. Our goal is to remain viable so that we can continue to provide all of our services to the community, the nursing home, home care, the hospital with the emergency department and ambulance services. So North Shore Health reached out to the National Rural Health Association and Stroud Water Associates. Stroud Water is a firm that has expertise in critical access hospital reimbursement for thoughts and ideas on how to minimize our losses while maintaining our critical services. The evaluation <coughs> suggested that we incorporate some of the space and operation of the nursing home to the hospital as swing beds. This recommendation was based upon the previous demonstration project commissioned by the off Federal Office of Rural Health Policy and the Health Resources and Services Administration. The project was known as the Frontier Health System, a model of integrated health service delivery and reimbursement that integrates critical access hospitals with other essential services, such as skilled care. Based upon the analysis, if North Shore Health transitioned basically on paper, one of our nursing home households to become a part of the hospital, our Medicare reimbursement would be increased by approximately $800,000 a year. By changing the areas of cost between the hospital and the nursing home differently on paper, it changes how we allocate the costs, thus increasing our reimbursement for Medicare. This change will impact our accountants rather than our nursing home residents. Residents would stay in their current rooms receiving care by their current wonderful caregivers. There would not be a physical change to our building or to our beds. The residents would stay in their same room in their same bed. The only thing that would change is the name of the location, hospital versus nursing home. However, to make this idea work, North Shore Health would need to increase our licensed bed capacity from 16 to 25 beds. We still need to provide service in the hospital. And that is why we're here today. North Shore Health, and the 10 additional critical access hospitals who are licensed for less than 25 beds and who have an attached nursing home are subject to the public interest review and bed moratorium regulations. The proposed legislation in Senate file 2704 focuses on rural communities and does not expand or change services offered. It will allow North Shore Health and the 10 similar hospitals the flexibility to increase our bed capacity and to reallocate the use of our nursing home and hospital beds in an effort to minimize our financial losses, yet maintain a very vital service. I'm asking for your support of Senate file 2704. Thank you, Chair Utke and committee members for your consideration. Well, thank you. And we do have uh, one additional testifier that would like to speak and then we'll get to some questions and comments on it. So, um, Ms. Kavanaugh. Welcome to our committee. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Utke. My name is Jamie Kavanaugh, and I'm here with the Institute for Justice, and I'm testifying in support of Senate File 2704. Um, the Institute for Justice is a national nonprofit that works across the country um, and has offices everywhere, including the, across the river in Minneapolis. Since 1991, IJ has been fighting <clears throat> to preserve civil rights and personal liberties. Um, I'm offering testimony today in support of Senate File 2704 um, because this bill offers a narrow solution for increasing access to rural healthcare services and keeping critical access hospitals in business. But I also urge this committee to consider um, amending the bill to either remove the 25 bed cap or eliminate the medical moratoria and public interest review process in its entirety. Today, uh, for decades, the Institute for Justice has worked to end anti-competitive laws. That's through both litigation and through legislation. Additionally, in 2020, I had the opportunity to write a comprehensive report about certificate of need laws around the country. My report included a review of the public interest review process in Minnesota, which is similar to certificate of need laws around the country. So today I'd like to share just a few brief points, um, some, some of the things I learned while writing that report. First, as a matter of logic, 
when the supply of something, hospitals, hospital beds, medical services is restricted, access does not increase. There's nothing about healthcare that makes this principle any different. So if the goal of legislation is to um, increase profits and make sure there's access in, to healthcare in rural areas, then the 25 bed cap is unnecessary. Second, medical moratoria have serious consequences. Earlier in the pandemic, Governor Walls loosened some of the requirements in response to COVID. But if moratoria created a more healthcare, as people would argue, then we would want more of them during a pandemic, a time when we really need access to healthcare, not less. I'm struck also by the comments that, um, that North Shore and other critical access hospitals need um, flexibility. And what will happen the next time that um, HHS, Medicare, Medicaid change their reimbursement schemes? Um, will we have to amend the law again just to allow for the proper reimbursements to allow our critical access hospitals um, to remain profitable? Um, the simpler solution is obviously allowing hospitals the flexibility right now to grow and change as their needs come up and get rid of the moratoria and public interest review process altogether. Um, finally, the country's most rural states often have no certificate of need laws or moratoria at all. So states like Idaho, the North, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming um, have no, none of these laws. So if constricting supply is not necessary there in very rural areas, it certainly isn't needed to protect critical access hospitals here in Minnesota. The only winners are the hospitals that exist. The moratoria give incumbent hospitals um, control of the market and economic protectionism is never a valid reason for a law. For all these reasons, I respectfully ask that the committee consider ending the medical moratoria and public interest review process. Thank you, and I'm happy to stand for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, members have questions for a testifier? Or Senator Bach, any follow-up that you wanna uh, ask of the testifier there first, but if not? Um, Senator Graham. Thank you, uh, Chair Aki, and uh, thank you testifiers for coming in person. I appreciate that. And, and thank you for shedding light on, on a problem that uh, is something that I have tried to work on uh, the six years I've been here. Um, we, we need to protect the small rural hospitals and uh, every aspect of our rural health system has been shrinking. And, and I think this is a, a simple solution that would really help um, what little hospitals we have left. In, in rural Minnesota. So thank you for bringing the bill forward, Senator Bach, and uh, hopefully we can uh, get this across the finish line. Thank you. Uh, next up, Senator Abler. Well, thanks. I hope we can get this done, but I just wanted to uh, commend Ms. Uh, Ralstad. Um, I, I think, uh, Senator Bach, I think you've got the award for the person who came the longest in person. So I think uh, we've had individuals coming from all over the state in the past, but not since COVID. So it could have been a Zoom call, but you're here in person and it's just really good to have you here and together testifier as well. But anyway, congratulations. I think you're absolutely the winner, so. Thank you, uh, Senator Klein. Thank you, uh, Chair Utke, and thank you, Senator Bach for bringing the bill. And I couldn't support it more wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, I, I work with the critical access hospitals in my role at Mayo accepting triage from your institutions. I have such respect for the work you're, difficult work you're trying to do in Grand Marais and so forth. Uh, and also just this difficulty that we've had with the excess capacity in hospitals recently, finding creative ways to get people discharged by utilizing swing beds, I think is exactly the right way to go. So I'm, I'm firmly in support. I would make a couple comments and I know we'll have more discussions chair about the moratorium and longer discussions. Um, but you know, another interest that is served by some form of moratorium laws is just the public interest, uh, which is that if you, if you have a system in which um, institutions add more and more hospital beds, uh, the culture does tend to drive towards filling those beds, both at the administrative and at the practitioner level. 
because uh, once you have something that makes money, you tend to do more of it. So there is some reason for us as legislators in the state of Minnesota to have some oversight over how many hospital beds are available in the state. Uh, whether the current moratorium system is, is workable or fungible is, is a bigger debate. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Wicklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for testifier for coming down um, to speak with us today. And, and it's really helpful to learn more about your situation and, and you know, how this bill would help you. Um, I guess my comment would be that I, I think in this case, in your case, um, you know, the facility itself is, is remote and doesn't have, there aren't a lot of other facilities located nearby that could um, take in residents conveniently. And I, I really think that that's a, uh, definitely a, a value um, that your area has in keeping, being able to keep people, you know, close to home. Um, I guess my, um, on the other side of it, just not being able to get the information from the public interest review has just a little bit of concern about um, the lack of um, information available to the legislature about this request. And then the fact that the, the bill will be permissive for all the other 10 um, hospitals and maybe it, it is a solution that um, can help all of them, but we really don't have the information um, available to us about how it will affect, you know, all, all of these other communities and maybe they are very similar to yours um, and maybe it just will be another um, a helpful tool for them. But I, I am a little bit concerned about kind of giving up that um, the ability for us to gather information about the public interest um, with these facilities and having a chance to kind of assess that. Um, so I, I think your, your reasoning for, for wanting to do this, and we do need to look at why um, the financial viability of your facility is in such you know, uh, difficulties and maybe there are other things that we should be doing to, to address that. Um, so those are my comments. Um, I think that hopefully going forward, we'll get some more information today about the public interest reviews and how it might um, help inform us on you know, this type of request um, and the other 10 that would be brought before or would have been required to bring before us. So thank you. Senator Wickland, I have a question for you. Um, were you saying you're wondering if the other 10 are included in this at this point? Um, I'm just saying that the bill makes it so that all of them would be able to make this change without a public interest review. And I'm just saying I'm, I'm concerned because we don't have um, any information brought to us about the individual situations. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Monahan, I've got a question for you because we were talking, sitting up here looking at a possible um, word change for the amendment. The bill as it's currently written, um, does it cover all 11 or is it specific to um, the one location at this point? Mr. Chair, members, um, technically it does cover all 11, but given the way all the other exceptions are written in this, they all are written uh, for a specific uh, facility. And so I think it would just be clearer if on 6.31, you uh, delete the first A and insert any, then it's clear and it, that it applies to any facility that meets the three criteria listed. Mr. Thank Chair. you. Mr. Chair, I can move the amendment. Uh, Senator Benson? Oh, okay, you move, the, move amend the amendment. Okay, Senator Benson moves the oral amendment. Uh, Senator Bach, any comment? Well, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm fine with that. I uh, I originally contemplated bringing this as a standalone bill for just one facility and just kind of thought it would be a better conversation for the committee if we kind of treated everybody that's in their situation the same. So drafted it and introduced it so it applied to more than just my one facility because the others are facing similar circumstances. And if they don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. Right. Just gives them the option. Perfect. Because um, that's... Um, what we were looking at, uh, we've got the list of all 11 of the 
facilities that are all operating under the same conditions. So um, we do have an oral amendment on the table. Um, any further questions or comments? Seeing none, everybody understand the amendment, just changing A from, from A to any. All those in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Any further comments for Senator Bach or the testifiers? If not, Senator Bach, any final well, comments? Mr. Chairman, I, I think there's a lesson in this for us is sometimes those of us that are legislators can help back in our communities. Uh, and it goes back, this facility goes back a long ways for me. Uh, back when I was in the house, because this is a hospital district, this isn't a standalone municipal hospital under general hospital levy, because our district, they didn't have the authority to even levy, even though it was publicly owned. And uh, so when I was in the house, we put a, uh, we, we gave them authority to be able to levy for their facility, but it was, there was some pushback about it. So we capped it at $300,000, uh, the maximum they could levy. When I came over to the Senate, I believe it was one of my earlier bills in 2003, uh, I took the cap off because it was pretty clear that this hospital wasn't gonna make it unless they could get some additional support from uh, the, the property tax system. I think if we had not done that, this hospital probably wouldn't be here and the nursing home wouldn't be here. And I took some real, <clears throat> criticism for taking that off because the, the levy that was 300,000 once upon a time is $1.3 million a year, but that's what's been able to keep it alive. And, you know, I think most of us probably take some things for granted. And I think a lot of people in the situation where I took the levy, the cap off, just assumed they were going to have a hospital. Well, sometimes you got to do things that maybe aren't that popular because you have information that maybe your constituents don't have. Uh, so I made a decision to do that here back in 03. I did something similar from my little hometown with their uh, ambulance levy that they had uh, not too many years ago where they could levy for their rural ambulance service, but they couldn't use it for any operational costs, only for equipment. So I took that levy uh, or modified that levy also. So my experience around healthcare, Mr. Chairman, has kind of been on the tax side of things. So I feel like in some small way, even though I've never been on the committee, I've helped some of our rural healthcare facilities to be able to continue to, to, to survive and want to thank uh, my hospital administrator, Kimber, for taking the trek down. It is a long ways. We probably won't have a testifier this session that came further than, than somebody from Grand Marais. But if, uh, if, you, if you find yourself on the North Shore, I'm sure if you give Kimber a call, she'd be glad to give you a tour. It's a wonderful facility. They just spent a whole bunch of money remodeling the nursing home part of it. So they have uh, single room or single bed units now in their, their nursing home, which wasn't, hasn't always been the case. Uh, so it, I'm sure she'd be happy to give you a tour if you find yourself up in, in Grand Marais sometime this summer. So. <laughs> okay, that, okay, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Senator Bach. And thank you to the testifiers too and um, for presenting today and helping us out. So with that, we will lay this over. Thank you. Okay. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, can I go straight to the floor? With, yeah. Senator Bach, the reason it got laid over is that's what the house did with theirs to work with their uh, um, policy bill. I, I uh, generally don't defer. Or would you rather house. go? I generally don't defer to the house, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Benson. Um, if Senator Bach wants to get the house to move their bill individually, I would encourage you to reconsider and I'd be happy to make the motion on behalf of Senator Bach when he's not here. Mr. Chairman, would I think it might get the house's uh, attention a little bit if the bill came over to him. Okay. Because uh, I'm not sure we're going to have as friendly a conversation over in the house as, as we're having here. But. Okay. Senator Benson, would you like to do that? Um, Mr. Chair, would you like me to make the motion now or 
at a future committee date. We do it now. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'll move Senate file 2704 as amended be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. Okay. Thank you, Senator Benson. Everybody understand the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was you, a good experience. You, you are off to the floor. Now bring in your house side and we'll make this work. I didn't ask for the consent calendar, but maybe, maybe, I, maybe I didn't want to overreach. Too far. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up today, we have the Minnesota Department of Health a presentation on the hospital moratorium law. And with us to start us off is uh, Stefan Gildemeister uh, with the department. Um, I saw him on the screen here earlier. So um, welcome to our committee. If you'd please identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, um, thank you for having me today. Um, for the record, my name is Stefan Gildemeister. I direct the health economics program in the Minnesota Department of Health. And um, I am here to share as you've asked for information on the hospital bed moratorium and some, some um, related context. Um, what I've prepared for today is to provide you some background on the hospital be uh, bed moratorium and the public interest review. Um, I uh, would like to give you an update on some current activities uh, related to public interest reviews. Um, you had been interested also in some findings and takeaways from some of our recent public interest reviews. So that, that is what I'll present third and I'll conclude as you requested with uh, an update on um, uh, service curtailments and the hearings that MDH um, has been conducting in this area. Um, I, I um, share with you a report we wrote in 2007 on uh, the question of uh, 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 investments in medical facilities and factors that uh, affect and inform those investments. It's, it's though it's a, a couple of years old, I think many of the findings in it uh, as it relates to the economics of healthcare are still applicable and perhaps useful to the committee. I'm happy to share the actual report with you. But with that, I wanted to start with the hospital bed moratorium. What is the hospital bed moratorium mm -hmm. law? Um, it essentially in Minnesota statutes 144.551, it prohibits the establishment. Uh, Mr. Gildemeister, um, we don't see your, you're trying to share your slides. They aren't up on the screen yet. Oh, it tells me I am sharing my screen. Yeah, it, it, across our screen, it says that you have started share, uh, screen sharing, but not, nothing shows up. All right, let me, I, my, I apologize. Let me give this another try. Oops, let's try something different. I, I apologize for this. Is this better? No, it's still the same. It just. Mm. It, it, Stefan, this is Lisa. Do you want me to try for my screen? Yeah, last time you did this, it worked smoothly. Okay, will you stop sharing your screen and then I'll switch Done. over? Okay. Now we're good. Excellent. Uh, you would think, Mr. Chair, after two years of doing this in Teams and Zoom and other application, this would work. Um, my apologies. Uh, Lisa, could you go one, two slides down? One more, please. Yeah, so where I had stopped was to, to articulate that the hospital bed moratorium uh, prohibits the establishment of new hospital licenses and also the expansion of existing hospital license beds. Um, as part of the uh, law, there's a process for reviewing 
proposals for exception to the moratorium. That is uh, what we refer to as the public interest mm -hmm. review. Um, there's also a process for conducting reviews when there are competing proposals in the sense that, that multiple entities wish to um, pursue a, pro uh, a proposal in the same area. And then it also identifies some responsibilities for MDH to monitor uh, implementation of exception after they have been granted. Um, next slide, please. The hospital uh, uh, bed moratorium was preceded in policy by, by a certificate of need process. Um, I'm not gonna say a ton about it, uh, in part because I, I, I have uh, limited time, but, but essentially the certificate of need process uh, was a federally funded process of capacity planning uh, that involved generally um, an agency to review proposals for certificate of need and then either grant them or grant them not. The difference there um, was that uh, generally um, there was not much of a um, public uh, uh, discourse about these proposals and they ended up being uh, administrative processes. Um, a Senate uh, research report um, in the 80s, I think, uh, came to the conclusion that the certificate of need process inadequately controlled growth in medical facilities. And the concern there was, was twofold. Um, it was about uh, a concern uh, related to increasing capital investments that are perhaps not, or were perhaps not necessarily productive. And to, um, to Senator uh, Klein's point earlier, that, that these excess, potentially excess beds would drive excess healthcare utilization. So the concern for the moratorium ultimately was about the cost of care and the growth in healthcare spending. Um, since the passage of the law, the legislature in 2004 uh, decided to pass a public interest review process. Exceptions to the hospital bed moratorium had, had passed, but, but uh, legislators wanted more information uh, to consider as they deliberate over an exception. And then since 2004, there were two more changes to the law uh, other than uh, the exceptions that were passed. Um, into the, into the 2006, a process for evaluating competing proposals and then in 2019, um, an establishment of, of timelines that would guarantee the legislature would have um, a public interest review before them as they considered a proposal. And I should say um, the health department did about nine public interest reviews since 2004 and, and 13 exceptions were passed during that time. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, you had asked about uh, a little bit background about certificate of need. I've said already a little bit about this, but essentially there are 35 states uh, in the country to our understanding uh, who have some form of a certificate of need in place. Uh, Minnesota is counted as one of them, even though our process is different as I, as I indicated. Um, there are a number of states uh, who don't have a formal process for capacity planning, but in, in those instances, the legislature may still take, take an active role in engaging in the specific proposals or more broadly. Um, as, I, as I noted uh, for, for the other states, the, the certificate of need process is generally, uh, rests generally with a, with a board, uh, for, for example, appointed by a governor or a state agency. Um, so it, it, is, it is not similar to Minnesota where the decision comes back to uh, the legislature. Next slide, please, Lisa. Um, so the public interest review is a critical component of the Minnesota hospital bed moratorium. Um, he, the exception process is kicked off by the submission of a proposal to the health department and, and the intent of the uh, reviews are to provide the legislature unbiased empirical information as you consider 
uh, proposals for exception to the law before you. Um, MDH considers a number of relevant factors, and I'll get to them in a second, and then makes a recommendation about whether a proposal is in the public interest. The uh, decision to grant an exception, as, I, as I've mentioned, rests with the uh, legislature. So the legislature retains the, the ability to grant an exception or not. Um, next slide, please, Lisa. So um, the public industry review is somewhat ambiguous as it concerns what is in the public interest. Um, um, there, are, there are two um, elements though that we consider in our review. Number one, um, factors that are directly identified in the law. And then two, also the history that led to the passage of the moratorium, which, which again is about concern about cost and overcapacity. So the five uh, uh, relevant factors that are, sp are spelled out in, in, the, in the public interest review section of the law in 144.552 um, requires us to consider whether the proposal is needed to provide timely access to care or to new and approved services, um, to consider whether the proposal might have adverse financial impacts on existing acute care hospitals with emergency departments, um, to consider the effect uh, mm -hmm. that proposals might have on other hospitals' ability to uh, retain staff, and this is typically sort of a, a regional analysis. Um, we are to consider uh, the extent to which non-paying and low-income patients will be served by the additional capacity, and then we also um, uh, are directed to seek the views of affected parties, which might be the general public or other facilities. Um, in the case where a new hospital is established, so where not uh, where the volume of license bed is not expanded, but a new license is issued, um, we're also to look at the ability of the applicant to maintain current levels of community benefits at existing facilities and to consider uh, a number of factors concerning plans for workforce at existing facilities, whether they uh, um, can maintain employment, uh, uh, training, et cetera. And uh, the health department in our review considers these factors uh, as a guide in our analysis. Um, we, we look uh, both uh, at the specific proposal, but also how it fits in to the broader healthcare infrastructure. And, and we consider multiple assumptions around um, sort of demographic growth, in terms of service need and, and the population. Uh, next slide, please. And, and Mr. Chair, if there are any, at any time questions, I'm happy to uh, break and, and answer them, but I can also take them at the end, of course. Okay, thank you. We will um, we'll let you kind of continue through and we'll try to hold our questions. We'll, we'll do it all at once once you get through the, all the slides. Terrific, thank you. So thank what is the... Mr. Chair, what does the public uh, interest review look like? Um, generally, MDH uh, uh, looks for uh, data already available um, in, in public reporting. So that's the hospital annual report on utilization finances, it's hospital discharge data, which are claims data, and, and data on capital expenditures and amb ambulance diversions. We also consider the literature to sort of understand the, the, the issue uh, as it concerns uh, um, um, improvement in the quality of care and access to services. Uh, we generally request data from applicants uh, when the information submitted to us is incomplete about the cost of a project, staffing plans, um, and then specific uh, uh, statistics that might not otherwise be available or, or accessible to us through our own analysis to the extent that uh, an and, um, applicant uh, conducts projections on future healthcare use, we ask for them as well. And then we uh, use data again to uh, assess a range of factors to, to analyze um, patient service mix and payer mix at a facility, to consider capital cost and financing models, to, to understand access by looking at occupancy uh, rates within the facility, uh, and patient diversion statistics, travel patterns um, by patients 
two hospitals, uh, including um, both the distance to services uh, uh, that the distance that patients travel to to um, access services. Um, we look at employment changes in healthcare staffing and then conduct our own projections of, of um, healthcare utilization when, when we think that is appropriate. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, roughly speaking, sort of since 2009, um, a proposal would come in um, at around uh, August 1 or the, before we have 30 days to review that proposal um, and, and issue requests for additional data. Uh, the, the applicant would submit that additional information within 14 days. And then we have about uh, 190 days to conduct the review and present the findings uh, to the legislature. Next slide, please. Um, the public interest review is really a, a public process as the, as the intent I think is. Um, all the information that uh, MDH considers is on the website, the application, the questions we ask, the information that has come back to us. And, and as part of uh, the process, we issue updates to the legislature every 30 days. And uh, Mr. Chair, you probably would have received some since um, it's been a pretty busy um, year for pub public interest reviews. Uh, Lisa, next slide, please. Um, I think I'll skip this other than to say, you know, we've conducted nine reviews and, and 13 exceptions were passed since 2004. They fall into a number of categories as, as indicated here. I can say more uh, at the end if there's an interest in that. Next slide, please. And one more, thank you. So I made the point to say it's been a busy time concerning public interest reviews and this makes the point, I think, um, at any time since July, well, since, since September, uh, we've had three public interest reviews before us. Um, the first two on this slide were um, uh, exceptions were actually passed before the review uh, was conducted, so that was a, a bit unusual, um, but uh, we submitted our findings at the end of January and, and concluded the, the first review. Um, we've had the North Shore review before us since September and since have received um, uh, um, uh, public uh, proposals from Fairview Arcadia for um, the establishment of a new hospital and children's health for uh, the, the addition of 22 licensed beds for children psychiatric care. Um, this is a bit of a busy chart and I don't mean for you to really uh, investigate the details, but it just indicates um, when uh, uh, we receive a submission, and then it estimates when the review would start and, and, and when we would conduct a hearing and submit uh, a report. Um, the challenge here that I want to point out is when MDH, uh, Lisa, if you could stay on the slide, when MDH does not receive um, proposals by the August deadline, uh, we're struggling, particularly if we have a number of reviews, we're struggling to present to the legislature information within the legislative session. So that is uh, probably not going to happen with the Fairview and Children's proposal, um, but we're working hard to get the North Shore proposal um, um, conducted and, and with the findings before you um, by early May or before. Next slide, please. I've been asked to, to say a few things about um, the challenges of the moratorium and the public in interest review. Um, it, it's, it's worthy a bigger discussion perhaps, but, but I'll just run down a, a couple of items here for your consideration. So essentially it's, it's a bit challenging for, for us to consider what's in the public interest because there generally are business and, and public policy uh, interests wrapped up in, into each other. Uh, basically no proposal a proposal only comes before uh, the, the department um, when an institution or when a hospital operator has a business interest that they want to pursue. Of course, it relates to access as well, but there's a bit tension between is this in the public policy interest or is this to satisfy um, um, economic interest of an institution vis-a-vis -vis others. 
Um, so the by design, the public interest reviews are limited in scope. Um, we are generally looking at specific proposals that are sp site specific and one of approaches. So rarely um, do we look at sort of a systematic consideration of whether capacity aligns with inpatient needs, geographic distribution and broader policy goals. Um, so it's the notion um, that, uh, um, that when the moratorium was passed, uh, the market share in the, in the hospital uh, market for inpatient services uh, is essentially was essentially baked in place. That notion translates into inequities in the existence, uh, inequities introduced by the moratorium. What I mean to say, and I'm sorry that I'm so awkward about trying to get to the point is um, some hospital operators, some hospital systems have a substantial volume of unused beds that are licensed that can be um, leveraged mm -hmm. when uh, capacity expansions are of interest. That is not the same for other facilities. So there's an, uh, 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 there's an inequity built into that system. Um, to look at this from a public policy perspective, the legislature essentially has created winners and losers and by granting an economic value to some facilities, but not others. Um, there's always a challenge with data. Uh, we look to make uh, our review really an empirical, an empirical um, uh, uh, consideration of, of the evidence before us, but sometimes we lack data on ED boarding, transfer requests, costs, um, um, as it concerns uh, uh, what patients pay, what government might pay, and, and transportation costs as well. And then the timeline, I think, as, as I diplomatically trying to make the point here, uh, that is in, in statute doesn't seem to align with how hospital, hospital operators uh, approach their uh, um, interest in, in seeking exceptions to the moratorium. Next slide, please, Lisa. Um, so what we wanted to show you here is sort of the, um, the story of uh, the distribution of licensed beds that are generally not available for healthcare services. But these are what some people refer to as bank beds that can be leveraged um, by some facilities and some healthcare system. The bigger the circle, uh, the greater the bank bed. Um, and, and maybe to just uh, highlight the top three, the University of Minnesota Medical Center Fairview has about 935 um, bank beds, Mayo Clinic, uh, Hospital Rochester, 825, Hennepin County Medical Center, about 439 beds. These numbers might be a tiny bit outdated, but, but those are, um, those are uh, um, roughly about right. Uh, most of them uh, bank beds uh, are located, as you can see, in, in, in the urban areas, which might make, which makes sense because they represent uh, previously closed large facilities that um, health systems took offline as healthcare changed and, and the delivery of healthcare changed. Lisa, next slide, please. Um, Mr. Chair, you also asked about um, our takeaways uh, as it concerns um, the review of children's psychiatric beds uh, at Prairie Care. And, and um, for this review, we did take a step back and um, 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 provided the legislature with some bigger picture takeaways for your consideration. And, and it goes like this, um, we, for such an important area of healthcare and wellness, collectively, we have an incomplete understanding of the need for healthcare services and the, and the factors affecting healthcare capacity bottlenecks. We do um, have a lot of information on the symptoms of um, healthcare capacity bottlenecks and, and evidence that um, patients and family caregivers are not always served the way we would want them to, but we don't have a really thorough understanding of what the underlying factors are. So we typically end up uh, 
focusing the discussion on the creation of uh, new facilities, bricks and mortar, more beds, and that may be uh, the right approach, but it may also not be the right approach. So um, what do we not know? We really don't have a good understanding of the number of children with mental health care needs and the type of services that they require. We don't understand what access there is to upstream outpatient services. We don't have a good understanding uh, what number of patients have had access to timely diagnosis. Uh, we really don't have a good understanding of the precise role that availability of labor force um, plays in, in access bottlenecks or payment rates plays in, in affecting access to care across the state. We do know they're an important factor. We do know they differ across the state, um, but we just don't know how much of that is the real underlying um, uh, factor of concern that also needs to be addressed other than bricks and mortar. Through the public interest review, we don't generally hear the voices of patients. Uh, we don't know what patients and caregivers uh, need, wish for, require what the experience was. And we think that's that's a bit of a weakness. Um, we, we generally make uh, state register notices, but this is uh, an administrative process that maybe patients and caregivers don't have access to. So there, there's work that we can probably do better as well. Uh, as it concerns data, uh, um, for specialty hospitals, we do generally don't have data um, on, on utilization, financial health, uh, financial statistics, uh, charity care and compensated care, um, principally because these facilities are not required to report annually such relevant data. With regard to children's men and youth men mental health services, that's a real um, that's a real shame because uh, and, and a single institution provides such important and such a big share of the overall care uh, that we don't have any sidelines on. Um, so there, there is a lot we don't know. Um, and then I want to conclude this piece by, by saying, uh, Mr. Chair, that even with the addition of beds at Prairie Care, we don't believe the capacity constraints um, have been solved. So I'll just um, I have a lot of more data in, in, this, in this slide deck that I will skip, but there are four factors that I want to quickly touch on. We know children are hospitalized routinely at facilities without pediatric beds. So they don't receive the mental health care services um, with the expert um, labor force and, and maybe in the expert environment, in the, in the right kind of environment. Um, we know families are traveling long distances for inpatient care, um, almost 500 uh, uh, times over the last two years that families have tra traveled 40 miles or farther to obtain inpatient healthcare services. Um, oftentimes children are temporarily boarded in emergency rooms, which is a traumatic event um, in, it, in and of itself as children are already particularly vulnerable. We've, we've counted about 900 times in, in two years where that um, was the case. And then Prairie Care reported as part of their information to us that they routinely received requests for transfers from other emergency departments um, uh, seeking beds for, for, again, children and youth for mental health services. And, and about 1,200 times over a two-year period, they had to decline. So a small number of beds will probably not be able to, to do away with those bottlenecks and those, uh, and those, and those challenges. Um, Lisa, next slide, please. And, and I want to conclude then um, with, with uh, one more slide. Lisa, thank you. With uh, the question that you had asked as, as part of the request uh, uh, for me to come before you, and that concerns the, the uh, legislation that requires a hearing uh, as a concern, uh, uh, a hearing when there is a proposed hospital closure or a cur curtailment of services. As I recall, the bill was passed in, in uh, last session. Uh, it's um, in Minnesota, Minnesota st Statutes 144.555. And the requ requirement there uh, is as follows. Um, 
hospitals or hospital operators must notify the health department at least 90 days before one of the following um, events takes place, a closure or limiting operations of services resulting in patients or services being uh, relocated to another hospital or campus, or a discontinu discontinuation of a set of services or capabilities such as maternity and newborn care, intensive care units, uh, inpatient mental health services, and substance use disorder services. In those events, when MDH is notified, um, within 45 days of notification, we must schedule a public hearing. And uh, Mr. Chair, since the law was um, uh, adopted in, in uh, at the end of June, uh, MDH has conducted two hearings and scheduled a third one. Um, all three hearings are about discontinuation of services or move, movement of services related to labor and delivery um, to various locations. Um, and uh, two um, were uh, submitted by, by the Alina Health System for their Regina and, and uh, Cambridge um, facilities. And the hearing scheduled for March 1 is for a health partners facility at Olivia Hospital in Minnesota. So um, these are active hearings under underway. Um, and I think it is fairly certain that there will be more hearings uh, yet this um, first half of, half of the year concerning the potential closure of um, St. Joseph Hospital and changes in services in uh, at Children's um, Health uh, Hospital in St. Paul. And Mr. Chair, that concludes the um, material that I prepared for today, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gildemeister. Um, and Mr. Dean, you were gonna, did you have questions related to this or you wanted to add some extra testimony uh, with this? So I think we'll take uh, first up if we've got any quick questions and then we'll bring you up to add your comments to. So members, um, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Gildemeister, I am so concerned about um, one of your latter slides, which had to do with inpatient capacity for children and youth mental health services. And uh, many of us believe, and it appears to be so, that our children who were the least impacted by the virus have actually been the most impacted by the result, the resulting actions uh, to contain the virus, particularly when we look at um, growing, escalating uh, mental health needs. And it's incredibly concerning that we don't even have a way to keep track of what those needs are. And as you've noted, uh, access to upstream care early, uh, including timely diagnosis, makes a huge difference on, uh, on the outcomes. And so I, I'd just like you to, um, if you can, address those two things uh, that are so important in, you know, in this place, we, we do things based upon, we try to do things based upon science, uh, data, and it would be, well, it would, it would be perhaps shocking and unnerving to get the data on the number of children with mental health needs uh, and the need for that upstream diagnosis. I think that is something absolutely imperative that we need to have as we move forward. Many of us feel that it will be our youngest generation that has been impacted the most uh, by COVID, not necessarily the disease itself, but by um, the societal uh, constraints because of that. And, and I think it's imp very important that we uh, have a better understanding of what the stat is so we can do a a better job of making sure we have first episode uh, centers or additional uh, the additional treatment 
and facilities and support ready. I'm just wondering if you can address that a little bit. Mr. Gildemeister. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Nelson, um, first of all, one correction, I've never quite finished my PhD, so the, the doctor, um, thank you for that, but um, I can't claim it. I will retract that statement. <laughs> Secondly, um, I guess I have to make another qualification. Um, you know, the team at the Health Economics Program um, has done a lot of work to understand uh, the mental health challenges and, and beyond um, uh, hospital inpatient capacity. But we are not the experts on, on uh, children's mental health or emotional well being. Um, with that said, um, I think you're absolutely right that, that there are clear challenges in the system and that um, for the duration that we have looked at this from a capacity, from a hospital inpatient capacity angle, um, there's been a lot of work done, but, but I think the challenges um, remain. Um, you know, we, we certainly, since uh, COVID has disrupted our personal and economic lives, have heard and experienced ourselves, I think, quite clearly that, that the pandemic has been destructive to mental health and emotional well-being. It's even harder for, for children and youth. Um, so, so we know this through surveys. We know this through anecdotal evidence. Um, we don't know it necessarily systematically. And there's an opportunity there to, to uh, think about how we better gather that information, even if we don't necessarily have a really um, robust baseline. But yes, I think uh, uh, you know if you wanted to address a complex problem, um, you're bound to have to um, first understand it well. And that means understanding um, mental illness as, it's, uh, as it is represented in the state, um, the pathway for accessing services in a timely manner and, and through optimal uh, circumstances, uh, the guarantee that the care is of high quality and aligned with um, the needs and, 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 and cultural expectations of, of children and youth, and then also that it is available at, at the level of robustness at which it's needed. I think the challenges with um, mental health services, certainly as it concerns inpatient mental health, is that um, hospital operators keep saying it's really difficult to generate a profit or generate a positive revenue with current payment rates. It's, um, we have not been able to really, we have not carefully analyzed that, but I think um, how to pay for critical services is, is, seems to me is an important question to consider in addition to understanding um, sort of upstream demand supply and how you guarantee that supply is equally important. Just a quick follow-up. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gildemeister, that was my concern. I want to just maybe clarify that a little bit more. Um, the, the question is, we make decisions based upon <coughs> data, and, the, and I understand uh, you are saying that we do not have, um, we have an incomplete understanding of the need for services uh, for our children's mental health. And my question is not, you know, I don't expect you to solve all of the capacity issues with uh, children's uh, mental health services. But what I want to know is how are we getting the numbers? How are we going to know um, the number of children with mental health needs and the types of services that they need and whether there's access to upstream uh, early diagnosis, that type of thing. I'm just so concerned that mm -hmm. there's this whole cadre of young children, students uh, coming out of the pandemic with these needs. But if we can't, if we can't even measure what those needs are, how are we to then supply the framework to meet those needs? So I'm just asking about 
how the needs are measured. How can we do that? Um, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that, I turned my mic off. Mr. Gildemeister. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Nelson, uh, uh, this is a research question. So I, I, I love that and thank you for that. Um, you know, for, for a naughty problem like that, I think you probably need to exp um, approach it in a, in a sort of multi-method um, way. Um, we certainly have data on uh, the use of mental health services and, and uh, on the healthcare side and through, um, through uh, the behavioral um, uh, risk factor survey, although we don't do it for children on a regular basis uh, or not frequently enough. Um, uh, hospital systems have information that they gather. We have some quality data on, on, on um, recovery from de depression. So uh, a systematic analysis of how to better use data that we have available is probably one approach. I think a second approach would involve um, effectively uh, using um, the education system to gather information and be a resource to students. That is already happening, but, but perhaps with more resources. We conduct the Minnesota student survey in the health department, um, but, but I think there's better work we can do and more in-depth work we can do to not just understand high level uh, estimates buried in, in a broader survey on a number of issues, but really focus, focusing uh, uh, on, on mental health. Um, I think this is also um, a topic where, uh, you know, we, you wanna conduct qualitative work uh, and, and, and have trusted um, partners to youth and children talk with them about their experience and their family members about their experience, their challenges um, uh, in, in, you know, maybe in focus groups, but maybe also in really in-depth uh, safe discussions uh, about their experiences. Uh, and then I think we probably want to talk with providers who are the, the, um, the in some ways, the first line of defense after families about how effective the system is structured for them to deliver care, di diagnosis, care, um, referral to, to children and youth and their, and their caretakers who come in with distress. So it's, it's, it's a, it would, in my opinion, it would be a complex undertaking, but um, a really important one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we've got some more uh, questions coming and uh, uh, I'll ask the same of uh, Mr. Gildemeister as we, we th have these questions for you. We'll try to streamline them just a little bit so we can get everybody's questions in here and get our um, testimony yet that we've got planned. So we'll fit as much as we can into the next 20, 25 minutes or so. So Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Gildemeister, just briefly for the benefit of the public, as they see licensed beds here, that is not A, equivalent to staffed beds, which we know has been fluctuating throughout the pandemic, but continues to be, was an issue pre-pandemic and will be an issue post-pandemic. And then another point, as people are looking at these licensed beds, there are some hospitals that don't have physical capacity. So not only are they not staffing those beds, they don't have the physical capacity to add those beds. And I think it's important for the public to realize um, we did a, a public interest review um, in I believe 2018, and you were constrained from looking at whether or not the hospitals in the region had staffed licensed beds or even physically available licensed beds. And so if you could in in two minutes or three minutes, just help the public understand that licensed beds are not representative of services that can actually be provided in some cases. Mr. Gildemeister. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Benson, uh, a very informed question, Senator, you, you know this topic. Um, Yes, Minnesota has about uh, 16,000 licensed bed, head 
16,000 licensed beds in um, 2020, latest year for which we have data, and uh, about reported about 11,300 licensed beds that same year. But um, uh, I'm sorry, 11,300 available beds that year. It's a it's an average number across the year for beds that um, are on can be brought online without major construction or without uh, with existing staffing to to um, uh, to care provision. Um, what we don't know, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Benson, is the extent to which uh, the number of reported available beds really varies on a week by week or month by month basis. But um, most likely there are some pretty big uh, swings and um, maybe I'm giving too much away here, but the, the, we're uh, about to issue some uh, trend data from from, uh, from 2020 uh, on some hospital statistics, and we're finding that that the number of um, hospital staff has declined that year. So uh, this is an area, uh, um, uh, Senator Benson, where we don't have real time or good data. Hospitals certainly do, um, but yes, your your general point is quite quite correct that um, uh, that. Uh, available beds are, are um, really fluctuating based on um, staff availability. On, on, the, on the topic of physical capacity, I think we have a, a little bit of an irony there in that uh, we've closed down a lot of hospitals and um, many facilities have space within them because they closed wings or, or floors. But um, since the moratorium law passed, we also have moved to single occupancy um, hospital beds, so that has changed plans for some facilities, limiting perhaps uh, how much freedom there is to bring on additional beds, even if there was uh, um, workforce there without uh, some major construction. So both good points, Senator. Senator Benson, any follow-up? You're good. Um, Senator Wicklund. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I. Um, Thank you for the overview. And I appreciate hearing again about um, the public interest review process and kind of where, where things are at. Um, and I appreciate your slide with the, the various challenges. And we've had discussions in other years about um, how the process that we have in statute isn't really, um, isn't really working as well as it could be. Um, and I know it, it, it's a, a more difficult question than you could answer in a real a uh, quick summary, but I just wondered when you look at all of the um, challenges on your some challenges page, um, do you think that this process could be modified to do a better job of you know assessing capacity and you know looking at things in a systematic way because I think there is value for for Minnesotans to understand our healthcare capacity and um, access, you know what not just capacity but um, access for Minnesotans to healthcare. Um, do you think that the current process could be modified to do a better job of this, or um, do we really need to? I don't know. Think think more broadly about how we do this work and um, assessing, you know, new projects as they come along. So I, I understand you want to confine this to a shorter period of time, but just wondering, just if you have any immediate feedback. Thanks, Mr. Gildemeister. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Wickland, um, really big question. I'll make three quick points. The first is, um, you know, the administration is not taking a position on the moratorium or come forward with a proposal. So I, I, uh, I'm not sure that I'm ready to um, highlight ways to um, improve the moratorium. I, I will make there were two additional points. Um, one is um, it would be helpful for the legislature to consider the tension between um, is, is the public, what's the public, public policy um, motivation for the moratorium? Is it to uh, avoid duplication, um, um, control cost, um, 
or is it or is it about um, structuring? Is it about hospital planning? So is it about something bigger than looking uh, at one uh, proposal at a time, sort of in a capacity planning uh, purpose, or is it really to ask? Um, there's a business interest in one area, and and we will evaluate that in isolation and doing so is just fine. So I think that's one challenge where the legislature um, uh, could, could deliberate. I think the second piece is the, the issue of inequities in that, uh, in that some facilities can um, establish and restructure mm -hmm. its hospital bed capacity and add capacity without uh, a delib deliberation. Um, before the legislature, um, and others can't, and, mm -hmm. and that 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 seems um, uh, to miss the opportunity to really explore the question of cost and um, uh, investment. Uh, the way the legislature seems to have uh, signaled an interest to do through the moratorium law itself. Thank you, uh, Senator Wigland. Anything else? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Gildemeister, and I'll be very brief. Um, you mentioned early in your slides that most other states that have this type of process do not generally make a final determination through the legislature, but through a special review board or the Department of Health or something like that. I guess presumably those processes are faster and more efficient and possibly more competent. Uh, can you comment on that or any knowledge that you have about those specific states? And then while I have the microphone, I'm just going to reiterate Senator Wicklund's point that I think a as we look at reforming this process, um, I thought your point about the one-off process that we have currently that evaluates a single request from a single hospital uh, being fairly blinkered was quite apt and that a, a, a process of reviewing capacity and need uh, and demand and uh, industry motivations across the state would be very informative to this body and also anybody that was in future reviewing these requests. Mr. Gildemeister. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Klein, um, maybe a, two quick points. Again, I know the chair wants us to move quickly. Um, I don't know a ton about a certificate of needs, but I assume in other states, but I assume um, you've seen one, you've seen one. So local jurisdictions would probably operate in different ways, depending on data, policy, politics. Um, my sense, though, is going back to, to where we were in the 80s, that the advantage that, the, that Minnesota, Minnesota's legislature has, um, though it involves uh, deliberations in front of the legislature, is that you have more information to make these, uh, these, these decisions. Um, I would also say, um, in and of itself, the process is not all that long, and I would be uh, surprised if if um, it's not a several months process uh, and maybe one that is less publicly facing than in Minnesota in other uh, um, that exists in other states. Uh, but um, Senator Klein, I, I what I know in preparation for today's hearing came from a report from um, a, a the National Academy of State. Uh, health policymakers, I'm happy to share that report with the chair for distribution to members. Maybe that's that is of help. Okay, thank you. Senator Klein, anything else? Okay. Um, Mr. Gildemeister, if you want to just uh, stick with us here a little bit, I'm going to, uh, Mr. Dean, if you'd like to join us, um, he's got testimony he'd like to share on this topic before we move on to the next uh, item on our agenda. Welcome to our committee. Um, thank you for joining us. Please identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Matt Dean and I am uh, representing the Heartland Institute. Uh, I'm also a uh, former HHS chair and house member and I am in uh, committed long-term recovery for that. And um, happy to be here before you today. Uh, Heartland's a 37-year-old independent nonprofit, nonpartisan group, 
and we provide information to legislators across the country. I focus on healthcare policy and finding uh, healthcare solutions. And I wanted to come and talk today because um, the, the health uh, bed moratorium in Minnesota is a very complicated issue. It's one that we ran into. Um, and I, my biggest memory of that is the Maple Grove Hospital. I remember sitting on um, where you are thinking, why am I doing this? Why is this my job? Um, and uh, it, it was very uncomfortable uh, and it was a very clumsy process. And so as I moved on, I, I kind of was interested in what other states do in looking at certificate of need. And um, I'm putting together research and commentary based on Minnesota, comparing it a little bit to other states. So in the interest of time, I know you guys are very, very uh, uh, pressed for time today. I'm gonna be sending you that. Um, but what I can tell you is that in basic form, uh, states try to limit the amount of hospital supply that they have. And to some extent, it's, it's uh, successful in some states and some places and other places it's not. Minnesota is kind of a little bit of a hybrid with our moratorium. It is a certificate of need state where we have to, you, you can't just build something, you have to go through this process. I think it's fairly unfair to smaller communities and uh, for people with limited access. So it tends to drive beds towards regional centers and large cities. Uh, but there's basically, and this is kind of the, 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 the gist of it, is that in looking at, at um, states across the country, uh, George Mason University did a, a study of 12 different systems and only found savings in, um, in net spending per patient in one of 12 systems and actually found excess spending in seven. So that of those systems that actually controlled beds, there was a higher case, a higher cost in seven of 12 and a savings in only one of 12. And that's kind of what we've seen consistently. So across the country, and it's one of the things that you've seen uh, where we have bipartisan um, support. So President Obama and President Trump agreed that uh, this is something that does need to get reformed and states across the country have been dialing it back or eliminating certificates of need or moratoria. So we're, we're a little bit of an outlier. We are, uh, of course, the state uh, where the women are strong, the men are good looking, the children are above average. And, uh, but when you compare us to other states, there's some may, sometimes some, uh, maybe some reforms out there that are a little bit um, better. So uh, I will be sharing that with you. And also uh, appreciate Senator Nelson's comments about people with mental health and mental health beds. Uh, specifically, and I know some states are looking specifically at targeting for that, and I'll be sharing some information specifically on that with you, Senator Nelson, and I appreciate that and appreciate your work uh, to make sure that we have those. Uh, basically, there's four things that, that affect access. You know, it's money, it's distance, it's uh, plans, and it's, um, it's staff. And staff are really going to limit beds right now because that's our limiting factor in the state. Uh, but anything that we can do to uh, improve access to folks who are struggling to get in and also to alleviate some of the financial stresses on particularly these small hospitals will be greatly appreciated. So I thank all the work that you're doing and that you will do. And if I can be of any assistance to any one of you, I hope you uh, give me a buzz. Most of you still have my cell phone. So. With that, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dean, for joining us here this afternoon. Um, I think we've just, uh, as they say, hit the tip of the iceberg on this topic um, as we move forward here this session and into the future. But with that, uh, yeah, we'll call on Senator Dreheim. Um, We've got a draft bill um, that we're going to discuss here this afternoon. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Abler. Just while he's walking up there, I just want to appreciate uh, Matt Dean's, uh, Mr. Dean's uh, comments. And I, I just uh, kind of listen, but I, I think in a time when there's more and more consolidations of large provider groups, uh, that this topic is very germane and maybe we're going the wrong direction with even regulating much of it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. Uh, Senator Dreheim, if you would uh, uh, like to explain the, the bill.
bill that you're bringing before us and then we will, uh, it, it just goes right hand in hand with our, what we've been talking with the moratorium. So Senator Drayheim. Thank you, Chair and, and members, and, and thank you for making time uh, for this topic. I, I think most of us have uh, heard probably one too many uh, bills on the moratorium over the six years I've been here. Um, but, but I think it is really important. And in Minnesota, we're really blessed to have uh, some of the best care in the world um, overall. But, but I do think there's a lot of room for improvement. And the, the one area, that I have tried to do uh, was in the mental health and I, I throw drug treatment in there. Um, and I don't know if the agency is still on, if they have a number of beds that are dedicated to mental health out of that approximate 11,300 beds, if they had a number, uh, Mr. Gildemeister uh, still on the call? Yes, Senator Graham, uh, yes he is. Uh, Mr. Gildemeister, did you hear the question that Senator Draheim had? Um, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Draheim, that is a knowable number. I don't have them quite at my fingertips, but um, either I can look it up or phone a friend and put it in the chat or submit it to you after, after the call. One, one point I would add is not every person with mental health needs is in a dedicated bed, and the same is true for uh, substance abuse patients, patients with substance abuse needs. Okay, thank you. And if you if you get that information before we're done here, um, actually, uh, just either speak up, put your hand up, or whatever to get our attention, and we can get your information live here before we're done. So thank you, Senator yeah. Graham. Thank you, uh, Chair Aki, and, and members. When I had a bill up, I think at eighteen. Uh, on this subject, I, I thought the number was 127 beds that were available. 127 beds, that's it. And, and I guess where I'm going with this dialogue is I, I think we've all experienced when we're out in our districts talking to our constituents, uh, stories from our, our communities of people that have to drive hours, six, eight hours to find a bed. And a lot of times it isn't in Minnesota. So we are a pillar of care here in Minnesota in almost everything we do, but I think there's room for improvement. And I have looked at this issue for years. I'm not saying that my suggestion is the only one out there. Uh, I am open for dialogue, but it's been almost six years and we've done nothing. Why not lift the moratorium on hospital beds for mental health? I, I, I don't see a fisker, excuse me, a fiscal cost to it from the state. Um, and I'm sure we will get a fiscal note as this moves forward uh, and through the process. But I, I, I think this last year with COVID and how it has affected our young people, how has it, and it's also affected uh, just the general public with alcohol use and drug treatment or drug use is way up. Um, I, I think it's time we act. And, and we've had this discussion, we've been waiting for that silver bullet to solve this issue. And, um, you know, Senator Box concept for the small hospitals, I, I think is something else we need to look at, but I don't want to confuse the two. I think we act this year on the mental health capacity issue and um, open it up. I would also like us to look at maybe an on-ramp and an off-ramp for hospital beds and explore that. Do any other states do that? Uh, would that help uh, alleviate some of the problems that, that we're, we're seeing and, and speed up the process? Just food for thought on that. I, I appreciate your time. And, and I think our main focus this year should be on, on mental health uh, for capacity. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Draheim. And uh, Mr. Gildemeister has uh, returned with his hand up. I think he may have an answer. Um, Mr. Chair, yeah, to Senator Draheim's question, um, the data that are reported to us annually um, document that they're about, um, so this is specific to hospital beds that are in dedicated units. 
Um, there may be other dedicated beds available, but there are about 71 chemical dependency, chemical, chemical dependency uh, beds in which those services are provided, about 1,032 mental health beds, and then the Department of Human Services and, and um, other facilities have about additional 309 beds uh, in units devoted to the delivery of mental health. So taking those two together, the last two, it's about 1,300 um, mental health beds uh, in dedicated units in the state. So again, with the disclaimer, this is likely somewhat of an undercount. Thank you, thank you very much. And I think, um, okay, uh, we'll go to Senator Coran quick and then I do wanna to get to uh, Ms. Aberholden for her testimony. Thank testimony you, Mr. Also. Chair. Just a quick follow-up to, to the response from MDH. So what's the breakdown between adult and adolescents for those beds? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gildemeister, did you have a breakdown at all between um, adults and kids uh, of those totals? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Corn, I, again, that is a knowable number and I'll get it to you in a moment. I just don't have it at my fingertips. I should also say the uh, thousand or so beds that I mentioned did not include uh, children's uh, beds dedic dedicated to uh, children and youth uh, provided by Prairie Care. So, but I'll get you those numbers and then maybe after the hearing, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll put it in writing so that you have it uh, in a very clear form. Perfect, that'd be great, thank you. Um, and now let's go to Ms. Abderholden, if uh, there she is. So thank you for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members, Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. And I wanna thank Senator Dreheim for always being such a strong advocate for mental health. Um, we agree with part of the bill and not part of the bill. Um, we do agree that we need more beds. Um, we have said that for years. Um, we also know we need to continue to work on things like early intervention. Uh, we will have a bill this session to create crisis beds for kids because we don't have those right now. Um, but we are concerned about having a freestanding psychiatric hospital, um, which we, uh, other than Prairie Care, which is allowed under federal law, we don't have. And I wanna just kind of talk about why. Um, so first of all, M Health Fairview, which is the one who wants the freestanding one, actually closed their beds at Southdale and will be closing their beds at St. Joe's Hospital this summer. And so in some ways they've already added to the current crisis that we're in. But I also wanna just remind folks, you know, if we look in the mirror, we can see our head is connected to the rest of our body. And when you're having an acute psychiatric episode, um, you know, some type of mental health crisis, you really deserve to be cared for in a regular hospital with access to any other healthcare that you might need. If we think about why people end up in the ER or a crisis, we can think about suicide attempts, right? Which can involve um, all sorts of injuries to the body internally and externally. Uh, perhaps a young person is cutting, intoxication or an overdose, uh, being homeless, and maybe your, your toes have been uh, frostbite. Um, and all of those actually require an integration, an integrated approach to care. And then when I think about people um, with serious mental health, um, mental illnesses, they often have diabetes, um, COPD, heart disease, liver or kidney issues. Um, one of the units is supposed to focus on geriatric psychiatric care. And in studies, um, we found that older adults actually have um, higher rates of emergency room use, longer hospitalizations, increased frequency of falls, substance use, and alcoholism. And so really do need that integrated approach. Um, we also wanna say that they're not gonna have an emergency room at a freestanding. And that means they can decide which patients they're gonna admit. And we are concerned that they won't take people who have the most serious mental illnesses. And then I also wanna make sure that people know about the IMD exclusion, that's the Institute for Mental Disease. And what that means is that Medicaid can't be used uh, in an IMD like it can for any other healthcare hospital. Um, if anything is over 16 beds where over half of the people are being treated for a mental illness or substance use disorder, um, Medicaid cannot be easily used. If you're fee for service, um, you can't actually, you know, get federal reimbursement for that. Um, if you're on managed care and it's more than, I think it's like 13 days, then the state actually has to take over paying for that monthly um, fee to, ma to manage care. 
So you're gonna be using honestly a lot of state dollars um, to pay for this care. And, and I think that's an important thing. And you know, when all the other hospitals, as we've seen, as, as Senator Durham has pointed out, are actually reluctant to add beds due to the low reimbursement rate, particularly under Medicaid, we have to wonder like how this hospital is gonna be profitable. Um, and maybe the only way is if you limit actually admissions from people on Medicaid. In a letter to many of us, when M Health Fairview first talked about closing St. Joe's back in January of 2020, they said that in defense of closing St. Joe's, that the hospital is operating at a significant loss of roughly 45 million a year due to reimbursement changes. And because of its age, it now requires more than 35 million in infrastructure upgrades. But the capital cost for this new proposal is between 57 and 65 million. Um, we're also concerned that if they admit far less Medicaid patients or people who have less serious mental illnesses, that could actually upend the payer mix at the other hospitals, with them serving a higher percentage of Medicaid patients and thus facing greater losses. And typically hospitals providing psychiatric services rely on providing other services to cross subsidize mental health care. Um, and this will also be the first time that we really see a for-profit um, healthcare agency coming in who has pledged to partner with them. And we have concerns about that. So again, as, as you, I've testified before you numerous times, you know how much I wanna expand the mental health system, but I also wanna make sure that we do it the right way and that we really treat the whole person. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Adpolum. I think you were kind of talking a lot about the Fairview uh, project and this is actually different than this. This is just uh, um, Senator Dreheim's bill talking about um, exempting mental, mental health uh, capacity and the idea of a, a new standalone hospital. Uh, we've got that correct, right, Senator Graham? I mean, this we'll, isn't specific to any we'll, project, this is in general. We'll, we'll see multiple bills on, on this moving forward in, in the coming weeks. And uh, members, I just glad we're, we're starting the discussion on the moratorium. And uh, I, I think the mental health piece piece is something we have to get done. We cannot chase perfection on this. Uh, we've waited and waited and waited. Uh, let's, let's work together. Anybody has suggestions on, on ideas? I, I look forward to Dr. Klein, um, your thoughts, Senator Wickland, uh, Senator Benson, and the rest of the committee on, um, on an approach that I think we can all agree to and, and move on. So we, we've, we've talked and talked and talked but we have failed to act. So uh, I think this is the year we need to act. So okay. thank you. Okay, we are at the kind of past our time, but is there a quick, anybody got a quick comment or question that they wanna end the session with? Senator Wicklund. I'll just make a, a quick comment. I, um, I hope to continue to have discussions with you. I guess the, this, con, this proposal itself seems really like it, it is, um, kind of too broad for what we need. And given um, the lack of um, kind of our understanding of exactly what our needs are for mental health, the types of mental health beds that we need and the locations um, statewide that we need. So to, to take off all the restrictions and just let, let people decide um, to go forward with projects without any um, state oversight to me seems like a, it's, um, letting go of too much of the um, ability for us to gather information and make sure that when facilities are built that they're uh, meeting needs we have and they're meet and they're doing it in the right areas and they're not also driving up costs um, as Ms. Abderholden mentioned for the state it could um, impact our state costs and I think we need to have a way to assess that so that would be my um, thoughts at this point thanks okay Thank you, and thank you, members, for uh, all participating here and uh, digging into this uh, important topic as we move forward. And uh, with that, uh, members, Wednesday we will take up the reinsurance bill, so that'll be our topic to uh, fill up that meeting, just like we did today. So with that, we will stand adjourned for today. Thank you. <laughs>